We've talked a lot about the, the who and the what and the where, but I'd love to talk just for a second about the why. And I want to give you one number here in China, 8 billion. That's the number of visits to hospitals each year in China, 8 billion visits a year. And some hospitals have as many as 10,000 visits a day. So Wang Shoukang, I, I would love to talk with you. You've got your, you know, your company, InfraVision, actually has a, a way to address some of this enormous burden. Do you want to talk a little about that? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for the uh, op opportunity. Yes. Uh, like Cliff men mentioned, so every year we have about more than 8 billion visits, outpatient visits in China alone. And for example, uh, one of the largest co chronic disease, lung carcinoma or lung cancer, has about over 1.5 million uh, patients diagnosed. In China alone, we account for 50% uh, of that. An enormous quantity uh, calls for um, more better health care, uh, more, say, uh, equal health care is, is, is tremendous. So uh, InfraVision, we founded uh, in uh, 2015. And after the graduation, uh, we, we think that I was doing um, quite a bit of uh, large-scale ma um, machine learning in, uh, in the US. So uh, we were doing things in for um, mostly advertising and for like um, uh, cap venture uh, capital. Uh, but uh, we've always wanted to, to utilize the most advanced technology to address the most fundamental problems. That's why we came back to, to China. To so but, but let's just drill down. So how does the AI technology, how does that deal with that enormous burden? Like what is the, what is the advantage there? Right. So uh, the machine learning technology is a cool technology that uh, it learns a lot of da data, a lot of um, the medical record and the imaging record and can ha have the ability to implement the technology like at a global scale. Right. right now, for example, our technology has been utilized by over 250 hospitals across the globe. And having, uh, having said that, we have, to we scan uh, lung cancer screening, uh, more than 20,000 uh, scans a day. So it's, it's, it's the speed, it's, it's uh, the huge volume. Wang Ray, I want to follow up on this. Um, a typical CT scan of a lung might have close to 700 cross-sectional images in it. So I imagine, you know, if you're taking the, a circle of something and you're, you're slicing it into 700 times, each, you know, a tiny fraction thick. For a human radiologist to evaluate a CT scan, how long would it take? Well, it works like this. Traditionally, a traditional uh, radiologist, when uh, screening for uh, nodules, it will take them an average of uh, 10 to 30 minutes. With the help of AI, they can do it within seconds, uh, just for screening, screening of the pulmonary nodules. That's the value of AI. And AI has huge potentials in China. Uh, because uh, in uh, China, we are adding 3% more radiologists uh, every year, but we are adding 30 to 50% more images, more scans every year. So this is an unmet need. We need AI. So part of this is the efficiency, but, but Simone, you were at Goldman Sachs. You had a pretty good career at Goldman Sachs. You gave it all up to start your own VC firm. And, and part of that may be looking for efficiencies in, in companies, but you're also looking for breakthroughs. And that's the other part of the why, right? Yeah, um, I, base, I mostly invest in, in biotech companies that are devoted to combat cancer, in particular in the area of uh, immuno-oncology. So what we're looking for, uh, where, what we are looking at is uh, we're looking for breakthroughs. We need help. Um, when, you, when you ask why, uh, why AI? Because cancer is itself is an AI cell. It's complex. It's difficult. So we, we could leverage uh, algorithm um, in um, cancer testing, testing, sequencing the cancer patients to provide the cancer patients with right position medicine. And we can use AI to sequence the blood in order to catch the uh, recurrency in time. And also we look, uh, we use algorithm um, in small molecule drug discovery, hoping to find new target. 
And we also leverage AR algorithm uh, in large molecule discovery, hoping that we will be able to um, they predict uh, new antigen progression in order to uh, come up with uh, cancer vaccine, so to speak. So we need help. So I love this this idea of the cancer cell being an AI. What you what you mean by that is it learns on its own, it adapts on its own, right? Yeah. So it's, it's it grows. Cancer um, in um, in a very famous uh, paper put out by uh, Robert Wensberg. Um, he characterized the, the, uh, the, the, the smartness of cancer and naming it as the next generation cell. But we, when we look at today, we think it's an AI cell because it grows faster, it moves faster, changes faster, it hides well. <laughs> so whatever, you know, one single uh, uh, solution treatment is not going to be uh, enough to combat cancer. It's a, it's a combinational um, approaches, you know, surgery, radiation, small molecule, T cell, immuno oncology. So to use AI to catch AI as part of the tools. Gary, um, you know, you've had extraordinary success uh, as a venture capitalist uh, investing in many of these technologies. I think you've got something like 22 unicorns that have come out of your uh, portfolio, and five of them are in healthcare. Um, but but you have really sort of been early in identifying many of these new technologies. Tell, tell us where, why you think China, I know you're in the US now, what, what is the difference between the way Chinese companies are pursuing this and, and the US? So the context for China in healthcare was in 2005 when we started to look at healthcare as an investment area. China was spending about 2.7% of GDP on healthcare. No, it it couldn't go down. <laughs> Um, now it's roughly seven, you can argue 6.9 to 7.5 percent. And so what's, the other thing that's changed dramatically is the kinds of mortality in China. In 2006, if you look at the top 10 causes for death in the U.S. and the top 10 causes for death in China, one of the 10 in the U.S. was in that list for China. Today, seven of the 10 are the same. And that's due to the lifestyle disease, it's due to the pollution, it's due to a whole variety of areas, um, the uh, instances of smoking and so on. So the countries are normalized, but if China tries to solve its healthcare problems the way the US has, mm -hmm. it'll bankrupt the country. And so one of the first things that, has, that AI can be helpful in, in addressing, so we're the largest investor in healthcare in China. We have 87 portfolio companies that do healthcare. About one third of those are in services. And what AI can do, like for example, China has an incredible shortage of nurses, an incredible shortage of doctors that are, that are well trained. So not only can AI improve the training, it can also allow you to deploy that technology in remote areas that have simply no people there to care mm -hmm. for them. They don't have nurse practitioners. That concept hasn't really been taken up as much in China yet. The agent care requirements are vast. So just the service delivery, the service provisioning in China is an absolutely massive requirement. Um, there, are areas, there are areas in the US for about 20,000 square miles with 40, 50,000 people and no doctor. So if you just simply look at those, those areas for solution where you're bringing the care forward through some representation, part of that can be online, part of that could be through some form of robotics, but it's also much more enhanced training for the actual service providers. Yeah, so I, I think that's a great point. I definitely want to come back to that. But the one last part about the why really has to do with what, what you're doing, Li Hong. Um, you know, you've got this, you know, venerable 67-year-old uh, healthcare company, a drug discovery company. And why are you bringing AI and how are you bringing AI into, uh, into your new technology discovery? Well, AI is uh, bringing sea changes to the healthcare industry. For many uh, of our formulations and the new drug discovery, we are leveraging AI for screening uh, purposes so as to shorten our R&D uh, cycle. As a traditional uh, pharmaceutical uh, company, um, we are always focused on using the latest technologies in our research and development. And uh, uh, nowadays, 
uh, we are also uh, using AI to empower uh, some uh, end uses, uh, such as uh, analytics of the uh, patient's uh, cases and uh, patient uh, services. We are working with iFly Tech using their uh, speech recognition uh, technology. We are also working with MIDI uh, to have jointly rolled out uh, some smart pharmacies. So with the uh, smart uh, pharmacies, we can reduce the wait time while increasing the accuracy in drug dispensing. It's fantastic because it's, it's you know, both efficiency, but there's this sort of line between efficiency and breakthrough. And I, I'd love to come back to what, what Gary had just mentioned, which is that just, again, across the, 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 the geographical regions and the rural areas where you don't have a lot of doctors. We talked earlier, uh, Wang Ray, about the... Um, the use of, a, of your technology in community hospitals because that was so essential because they don't necessarily have the access to the top tier expertise of the, of, the, of the top hospitals. Talk a little bit about that use case and why that's so important. Well, in uh, China, the biggest value of AI is not only with the Grade A tertiary hospitals, but most importantly with uh, grassroots community uh, hospitals. That is true in any country, in all countries. Uh, most of the medical resources are concentrated in a few number of, uh, a small number of hospitals. But China is a vast country uh, with vast rural areas. With AI, it is intelligent, it is portable, and it can provide teleservices. It's objective and standardized. So uh, it can be um, uh, deployed uh, in uh, community hospitals so that uh, their practitioners are better able to diagnose and treat diseases. Uh, second, it is standardized. And uh, third, it can be combined with the latest uh, new technologies like uh, networking uh, to improve sharing of uh, healthcare information and uh, resources. That's why AI is, is so powerful at community hospitals. Simone, I just want to follow up on this too, because we talked earlier when we were doing our uh, our judging for the contest, and thank you, Mr. Wong, for, for participating in that. Um, but we, we talked a little bit about accuracy and the, and the sort of difficulty of not knowing uh, how sensitive and specific the AI uh, results were. But right now, at least in the U.S., certainly, medical error is a huge problem even with the standard uh, protocols that we use, just sort of human error. And it's an incredible add to the waste in, in the healthcare spending. So, I mean, is it, is it fair to hold AI technology to that standard, or should we hold it to a higher standard? What do you think? I think a high standard better, because we're talking about human lives, especially in cancer treatment. Mm -hmm. So let's use uh, um, um, tumor cancer testing as an example that you can't tell a patient that you are 80% you know, cancer recurring. Right. So with the, uh, head of, with the help of AI, actually we could bring it up to 99.9% .99 because when you are uh, designing an IVD product, um, if, you, if one tube can include um, all the, 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 the uh, primers that are associated with cancer, cancer genes, then it is possible. Yeah. It's just humanly the computation is not possible, but with algorithm it's possible. So we can bring it up. So, I, and that brings up a really good question, and Wang Shokan, I, I would love to ask you this, about this idea that we're talking about AI almost in a vacuum, you know, as if it's this algorithm in a box. But really what we're talking about as the best possible use case is combining human and AI, you know, the, both of those skill sets to look at this. You know, how, do, how does your technology incorporate humans and, and AI? Yes. So um, we've, we've always think about like AI not as much artificial intelligence as much as augmented intelligence. So for example, uh, our technology with our physicians can improve from, uh, from our one of the large scale uh, clinical trial it says that, um, so two very best physicians, they have a mutual agreement uh, rate about like only about 60 to 70 percent, meaning that they are either both wrong or both right. right? <laughs> so that's, that's, that's the know. data, very interesting. Yeah. 
and our technology combining with uh, uh, our f physician improved the mis uh, misdiagnosis, uh, so uh, decreased the misdiagnosis rate by 15 percent. That's for early lung cancer detection. Uh, that's 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 how we uh, utilize the technology. Wow. And in terms of diagnosis, Li Hong, um, you know, how much are you using AI for to help with diagnostic tests that pair with your drugs, um, making sure that people are getting the right, that the patients who are getting the drugs have the right mutations or the right molecular signatures that work with those drugs? Well, if we use AI, then in the we can work with uh, hospitals uh, with the diagnosis and the uh, hospital uh, database in a more effective way. And uh, for prescription and use of uh, medications, uh, we need pharmacists at the hospital-based uh, pharmacies. Then with the help of uh, AI, uh, some simple errors can be picked picked up, like uh, miss uh, prescription or miss uh, dispensing or the missed dosage, uh, so on and so forth. With AI, uh, we can reduce those human errors uh, because uh, we, we do have a lack of uh, pharmacists. The important point is, you know, AI is, is sort of reducing human errors just in the basic system. And Gary, um, you know, a lot of this is sort of driven, and we've heard this all day and yesterday, uh, with data. You know, we need, it, it's only as good as the data sets that you're training your AI algorithms on. And, you know, you, as, a, as someone who's got a, a vision across the healthcare space, how good is that data? I mean, people complain about their EHR, their electronic health records data everywhere. Doctors are up, to, they're pulling out their hair, mm -hmm. um, you know, for those that have hair. Uh, and, and so how good is that data? So today the data quality is very low in the United States and it's awful in China. And I'll give you a couple examples. Um, so in China, there's a simple code, an uh, international code for diabetes. Mm -hmm. But in China, there are actually 17 different codes that are used for diabetes. So when you get information from one doctor to another, they actually don't know, is this diabetes or is this, or is this not? So to the suggestion that was just made about some form of standardization and, the AI, and an AI system looks for exceptions, mm -hmm. that is something that in the paperwork side, the administrative side, is a no-brainer. Huge savings. Um, another example of, of something that's quite pro problematic for the states in terms of data is one-third of the patient readmission or pa of hospital admissions are readmissions mm. for chronic disease. And over half of those, so basically 20% of all hospital admissions are due to the fact that the patients weren't taking their medicine. So if you could create a system by which you could have a reporting system or an AI facilitated um, you know, scanner or, or sensor that would actually let the doctors know, hey, your patient's no longer taking that medicine. Yeah. That could potentially be a very, very significant, you know, opportunity. I think the, the one challenge for data in the U.S. is the HIPAA restrictions. So doctors cannot share data with about one patient with another, and that makes it very difficult to, to actually create large pools of data. China does not have HIPAA restriction. So we actually just invested in a company that is doing a, hmm, they're doing a blockchain, it seems like blockchain's in everything, but they're doing a blockchain way enabled encryption of a patient's data, where you can then go inside and actually modify the data and extract what you want while it's encrypted. So no, no service provider, no pharmaceutical company would ever get access to the, the anonymity, to break the anonymity of the data. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna do a deal with a hospital uh, in China that has 15 million patients. So it'll be interesting. That will make that data better. By the time we get around to getting the patient data in the U.S., we would have already come up the learning curve in China. So the data doesn't have to go between the two countries, which wouldn't work, but the learning mm -hmm. can. Yeah. And so I think that kind of cooperation could be very valuable. You know, I, I agree, and, and that's it's, it's interesting. Simone, I mean, you actually had a, a one of your companies, your portfolio companies just uh, uh, listed on NASDAQ. You were there for the listing ceremony. Uh, the, 
the difference between the U.S. and China, I mean, the drug regulation in the U.S. is very, very strict. Um, and, but even on the device side, it's, it's not 100% clear which of these AI devices or AI uses are devices versus um, just helping. Yeah, exactly. How do, you, how do you navigate that as an investor? Uh, you learn. I think uh, US FDA is very uh, helpful. Um, it is, its objective is to, to promote a new technology and to co-study. Sometimes we go to a pre-IND meeting, there are six of us and there are 12 of FDA uh, participants. So I, I think the, uh, um, the, the, the culture of cultivating new technology is certainly there in the US. But what makes me feel very happy is that I'm a Chinese, that um, our FDA has made great leap forward, mm -hmm. great, great leap forward, um, you know, completely, uh, complete makeover. So I think um, that the culture is also changing in China. I think that with that and with capital support, I think, you know, the, the breakthrough type of innovation is also possible in China. Yeah. Can I, can yeah, I add one thing? So yeah. when we first launched Qi Ming in 2006 in the healthcare practice, in 2006, one foreign compound was approved for release in China. Now. Last year, there are 116. Yes. And at the same time, only one new compound that was not a generic reformulation. There was one new unique compound going through the SFDA process, you know, Chinese designed uh, you know, uh, product. Now, 375. Right. So, I mean, we're, these are profound changes in terms of the R&D capability, and the China FDA is now following its own rules. For the longest time, it didn't follow its own rules, which is why you had all the hideous problems in the healthcare system in, in China. But now that they're following their rules, the quality level is, is increasing dramatically. Shokong, the one of the uh, things that have changed the landscape so much is this ubiquity of fitness trackers and all sorts of wearable devices and the ability to get continuous data uh, you know, in, in real time. Uh, which are allowing us to check heart rates and systolic blood pressure and blood oxygen levels and activity and sleep patterns. How are you using that kind of data in new AI applications? Right, right. So uh, information focus is, is more about imaging AI, right? Medical imaging AI. But uh, in our, we have an internal department called Advanced Institute. We are now uh, studying like more patterns uh, in addition to the imaging itself to recognize further diagnosis, even differential diagnosis. So for example, uh, our new uh, say NLP team are utilizing the EMR data with the imaging data to better uh, infer whether this patient is more likely to be malignant or, or just benign. So you're combining the imaging data with another kind of biomarker, right? Yes. Wang Rei, are you doing something similar at, at Huying at, where you're looking at, for example, imaging data through CT scans, but then looking at somebody's blood test or a marker in there to, to help you know, pinpoint the diagnosis? Yes, we're also working on a similar uh, uh, work. The entire healthcare decision making, imaging is a very important part. It's a result of the diseases, but in the process, there might be many, for example, clinical data, DNA data, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's kind of a full dimensional data. If we can collect and sort out the entire data, and to establish a model that will be very valuable, can be really implemented. Imaging is only a demonstration of the results. You, Mr. Lee, if if your uh, if you could tell us if your of your efficiency has gotten better in recent years in terms of finding targets through the new technology, is it actually working for you? Yes, through. AI technology, as I said, first of all, in R&D, uh, uh, efficiency has been greatly improved in the past. To do a screening or of a pharmaceutical, it took us three to five years, but now only one year. This year, we also have a new drug a clinical test. 
it's an antibiotic medicine, so efficiency has been greatly improved. Also, at the terminal end, we're going to provide more convenient services for chronic disease patients. Those in our data, it only shows the drug, or when it's finished, uh, close to finishing the drug. We will alert him or her, you need to go to the pharmacy, to the hospital, buy more medical lactate to offer more uh, convenient uh, services. Finding the right patients for clinical trials. Patients, can AI help us do that? Gary, uh, are you looking at you know, companies that are expanding the use case of AI in clinical trials, for example? So we have two investments in China, the largest um, clinical trial companies. One is Tiger Med, uh, which is based in Guangzhou. And what they have started to do is they use AI to start to analyze best fit mm -hmm. for trial. Right. So when you're looking, you know, China is a good place for trials, large patient populations. So during the recruitment process, they now have some algorithms that they apply. But I would say we're relatively early yeah. in, that pro you know, on the, in terms of using AI on the trial process. So that's my next question. But I'd love to see if the audience has any questions or comments for the, for the panel. Does it, do we have any? any? Well, if you, if you do, please raise your hand and we'll get a paddle to Oh, right here in the front row. Let's wait. Uh, let's Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to ask a question. A few days ago, a Chinese scientist issued a news, had the news he has completed a, a, a DNA uh, uh, editing of a newborn uh, uh, baby, which caused a lot of uh, uh, debate internationally. So can you say something about this? Also, in the human gene, so what is the AI uh, application here? Let me just try to answer the question. First of all, either way, uh, first of all, this uh, is not a breakthrough. Using, CRIS using CRISPR technology to edit in gene is, is, an, is not something new. It, it could be done. So what he did is not an innovation. He just did something that actually was not permitted by law. In China, there, are, there were laws clearly promulgated in 2003 forbidding this kind of behavior. So AI, yes, uh, with the advancement of technology, whether it's artificial intelligence or other form of technology, you can go very far. But technology, technology must be guarded by our value and wisdom. And so that's, uh, so I'd love to get, Gary, please jump in on this, yeah. You know, so <laughs> I think this was great. That number one, he did it. And number two, he went public with it. Because did you have any doubt that it was happening anyway? So the fact that this is now public, you have this, now you can have a discussion. I would say I, we have two companies that we've invested in that are preparing CRISPR trials on human beings in China, okay? So that research, you know, to, your, to your point, that research, all how to do this is well understood. And the U.S. has a poly, well, we shouldn't. And part of China says we shouldn't, part of China says, well, why not? George Church, a very famous researcher from Harvard, um, echoed that sentiment last night after this. He goes, one, we don't know yet if it's real, so we still have to establish whether it's real. But if it is, it's great because you pull the cover off. Mm -hmm. So now you look at it, no, this is going to happen. This is happening. What should we do about it? And it's, and it's happened before. It happened with stem cells. It happened with cloning. Remember, there was the uh, baby that was born cloning. I think her name was Eve. Um, it's happened with a lot of these other technologies. Uh, Mr. Lee, I'd, I'd, I'd love to get your take on this because you actually run a drug company, and um, this is obviously you know, an experience that you might have to face in the future. I think traditional drug industry is mainly small molecule research, so we have more experiences in that. But in the DNA research, indeed, there are many problems for us. One is ethical, another is law, legal problem. This, no one is science technology. Has it reached the, uh, the verification of its technical level? So for a professor, maybe 
uh, a professor in Shenzhen to publish his results of research. Many of us are not clear about this, but I like to say we have to verify that because there's no way for us to verify whether he has done this, what kind of uh, implications this has on us, whether or not it is very uh, e efficient or effective. We can not do any verification. So we need to be very prudent and careful treating about this matter. Another comment or question from somebody in the audience? That was a good one to get us started on. So, but it does bring up the question of ethics um, and, and AI. And, you know, the, the difference isn't that this is a qualitative change in some ways. It's a quantitative. It's, it's, it's just making things so much faster. But it also could be, you know, we talked about this in a couple of other areas, a black box. We don't know what's in the algorithms. We don't really know how it's coming up with what it's coming up with. Uh, Wang Wei, what, why don't you talk a little bit about what you know about your own algorithm? Uh, I'm not a, t a member of the algorithm team, but I, I participate in a lot of work in the R&D of the product. Algorithm, in essence, at least AI medical imaging for the entire process is a, a involvement of multiple disciplines for China, for the US. This is a brand new uh, cross-disciplinary effort. We need to people who understand imaging, who understand medical, who understand algorithm, who understand engineering to participate. The biggest result or experience for me, the new technology actually is standing on the basis of the former previous technology. As for algorithm, because I'm not an expert on algorithm, but I, I, I do know, including AI in the entire history, there has many years of history. It has its peak and its trough. So because of the accumulation of uh, data, improvement of uh, computing uh, capability, we found a good breakthrough I think. So this is the biggest uh, success of the imaging. I, I'd love to actually kind of broach a similar question to you. I mean, we, we talked earlier about the difference between deduction, about finding these patterns and figuring out, you know, what by, by a training set and figuring out, okay, what's similar to that. But what about induction? What about actually using AI to solve a mystery. And this is kind of close to what Simone is looking for in the breakthrough. But, but, but Shokan, why don't you talk about how close we are to that? Right. Uh, induction is hard. I think mm -hmm. it, it, in, induction is, is something that, that as humans, we are, we're, we're, the, the reason we're, hum, we're humans is very unique for. You know that we, we, we learn something and, and kind of apply the very essence to something really new. Mm -hmm. And for AI, we uh, well, for medical AI, we have not seen that clearly, uh, say in the production level. But I can tell you one of our um, um, articles uh, doing something very interesting that we have two groups of of not, actually they are not patients, but one group of people have a long smoking history and the other group have no like smoking history. And we have their MRI scan, brain, uh, brain MRI, and the physicians can now really tell the difference between smokers a brain MRI image from the non-smokers. But interestingly, AI can do that. Mm -hmm. And that tells something that we as humans might not even know so, and do you know what specific, is there a molecular aberration? Is there a change in the tissue? What is the AI seeing right. that the doctors through history couldn't find? Right. Uh, interestingly, we've, we've seen the salient map of the algorithm. Mm -hmm. uh, so unlike what our human eye see things, we, 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 all, we often focus on very specific areas of our image. For example, I'm seeing you, I cannot see the audience, although I can, I mean, my, my global eyesight can see that, but not specifically. Mm -hmm. But AI algorithm can do that in the same time, both very specific and global mm -hmm. uh, scenarios. And we see the CDM map lining up at every corner of the map. Yeah. So in the, in the next couple, we just have a few minutes left, but I'd love to get everybody's take on you know, what they think is the sort of killer app 
you know, whether it's something that you've been working on, something you think is close, but how is AI, what is the one application, if you had to choose one, that's going to transform medicine as we know it? Gary, you want to take that one? So I actually think it's how, it's something about how AI is used. So I think the way that the biggest outcome will be when we come up with the equivalent of open source mm -hmm. for AI for imaging. Because right now, it's really tied to people who have wealth or who have insurance. And I think that it, there's a moral imperative to make some of these technologies as broadly available as possible. And so it, was al it always used to be said, well, in open source, you can't make any money. Well, I think the, share hat, the shareholders of Red Hat, who just got $38 billion from IBM, would say, no, you actually can make quite a bit of money in open source. So for InfraVision or for companies, there'll be a series of building blocks, and you put that into the, the public domain, say, make it better. Right. And you turn loose the millions of brilliant students around the world that can make the base algorithms better. Yeah. And I think that we, we collectively have to figure out a way to do that with some of these solutions, because you are talking about people's health, and you're talking about you know, millions of deaths um, if this doesn't happen. Mr. Lee, do you have? Yeah. Very quick. Yeah. Oh, the killer app. I think AI offers for us a, a, a better uh, efficiency and convenience for us doing R&D or some of the model building or designing. Indeed, AI can provide to us a broad range of possibilities in space. Some people we cannot, sometimes we cannot imagine, so AI can help us to do this. Yes. I think now with the help of uh, AI, we can test the ca non-cancer patients. We can tell what these, each individual's driving mutations are. But I think in the future, what we're looking for is we hope to screen enough people to, to find uh, uh, new biomarkers in order to predict um, to screen cancer. Ray, in 10 seconds. Okay. Uh, <laughs> For me, AI, the biggest value is to provide a standardized, efficient uh, outcome for uh, top hospitals or grassroots level hospitals, unified standard. This is one value. Another thing is to enable our uh, doctor physicians to have more meaningful, valuable time span. Part. Uh, as much as innovation goes, uh, I think the cost reduction, if we can do the similar uh, procedure you know, at, at the margin of the original cost is also a very in innovative thing. That's, that's definitely our medical AI can do. And perfect ending. We've got three seconds left. Thank you very <laughs> Thank much. You, Thank you. Great panel. Precisely.